Good morning, YouTube, BookTube. This is Johnny. I thought I would just read some William Perkins. Yesterday I made a video and I showed you that in the mornings I've been reading uh, books on William Perkins, uh, like William Perkins, The Architect of Puritanism, edited by Joe R. Beakey and Greg Salazar. And reading uh, the gloss in the text, William Perkins on interpreting scripture with scripture by Andrew S. Bolich, Bolich. And also reading this book in the mornings on William Perkins, Faith Working Through Love, The Theology of William Perkins, edited by Joel R. Beakey, Matthew N. Payne, Payne and J. Stephen Stephen Eula. So this morning I was, uh, it is February the 1st, 2022, the first day of February. It is a Wednesday, it's 9, 10 in the morning. My wife went out for breakfast with friends to celebrate birthdays and then she's going to go grocery shopping. And so I'm, as my habit is in the morning, having devotions, writing in my diary. I'm on page 89 this morning for the year 2023 and reading Faith Working Through Love. And I was reading the essay here on the work of Christ by Raymond A. Blackster. And Blackster is, it says here, independent scholar currently working on a new translation of John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. And as I said in my video the other day, that when I read about William Perkins. I, now, in this book, the author refers to the, the 17th century edition of William Perkins' works, which is online. Uh, you can read William Perkins online, the uh, 17th century edition of his works. Uh, but these other, this guy, in this book, they refer to the new reprinting of the works of William Perkins that I told you about. Uh, the ten volumes of the, uh, the works of William Perkins who lived from 1558 to 1602. It's interesting that uh, William Perkins died when he was in his 40s and he died from kidney stones. <laughs> And he had just been married a, a couple of years. And when he died, his wife was pregnant. And she was a widow. And he married her in, probably in his late 30s. But the point is, is that when, I'm, when I'm, I look at the footnotes and it refers to certain of his writings, and I thought I would read from... William Perkins' Exposition of the Apostles' Creed, uh, just to give you a taste of what uh, this translation is. And he's referring, he's talking here about the incarnation of Christ. And he says here, the third question is, why the Son of God must become man? Answer. There be sundry reasons at this point, and the most principal are these. One, first of all, it is a thing greatly stands with the justice of God that in that nature in which God was offended, and the same should a satisfaction be made to God for sin. Now sin was committed in man's nature. Adam sinned first, and him, in him all his posterity. Therefore, it was necessary that in man's nature there should be a satisfaction made to God's justice. For this cause, the Son of God must, be, must needs abase himself and become man for our sakes. Secondly, secondly, by the right of creation, every man is bound in conscience to fulfill, every, e, fulfill even the very rigor and extremity of the moral law. 
But in considering man is now fallen from his first estate and condition, therefore it was requested that the Son of God should become man, that in man's nature he might fulfill all righteousness which the law does exact at our hands. Thirdly, he that is, he that is our Redeemer must die for our sins. For there is no remission of sins without shedding of blood. But Christ, as he is God, cannot die. For no passion can befall the Godhead. Therefore, it was needful that he should become man, that in man's nature he might die and fully satisfy God's justice for man's offense. For, lastly, he must, take, he must make reconciliation between God and man. He... Lastly, he that must make reconciliation between God and man must be such a one as may make requests or speak both to God and man. For a mediator is, as it were, a middle person, making intercession between two other persons, the one offended and the other offending. Therefore, it is necessary that Christ should not only be God to speak unto the Father for us and to present our prayers unto him, but also man, that God might speak to us, and we to God by Christ. For however, before the fall, man could speak to God even face to face, yet since the fall, such fear possesses man's corrupt nature that he cannot bid the presence of God, but flies from it. Now, whereas I say that it is necessary that the Son of God, for the causes before alleged, must become man, the necessity must be understood in respect of God's will and not respect of his absolute power. For if he for if he for if it had so pleased God, he was able to have laid down another kind of way of man's redemption than by the incarnation of the Son of God, and he appointed no other way because he would not. Thus much of the Incarnation in general. Now follow the duties which arise of it. And first, we, must, we are taught thereby to come to Christ by faith and with all our hearts to cleave unto him. Great is the deadness and sluggishness of man's nature. All our hearts, all our hearts to, to cleave unto God. Great is the deadness and sluggishness of man's nature. For scarce one of a thousand care for him or seek to, to him for righteousness and life everlasting. But we should excite ourselves every way to draw near to him as much as possible we may. For when he was incarnated, he came near unto us by taking our nature upon him, that we again, how whatsoever we are, might come near unto him by taking unto him his divine nature. Again, when Christ was incarnate, he was made bone of our bone, flesh of our flesh, and therefore proportionately we must labor to become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, which we shall be when we are mystically united with him by faith and born anew by his spirit. Moreover, Christ by his incarnation came down from heaven to us that we, that we being partakers of his grace, might ascend up to heaven by him. And thus we see how the, the mediation of Christ's incarnation, wait a minute, that's not right. And thus we see how the meditation of Christ's incarnation should be a spur to prick us forward still more and more to come to Christ. Du duty two, secondly, Christ's incarnation must be a pattern unto us of a most wonderful and strange humility. For as Paul says, Quote, being in the form of God and thinking it no robbery to be equal with God, he made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 7. Yea, so far, so far forth he abased himself, that as David says, he, was, he, quote, was a worm and no man. Psalm 22, verse 6. And this teaches us to lay aside all self-love and pride of heart and to practice the duties of humility as the Apostle exhorts the Philippians in which every man by nature conceives, wait a minute, it's not right, 
as the Apostle exhorts the Philippians in the same place, and that we should do when we begin to cast off the high opinion of every man by nature, can seize of himself and become vile and base in our own eyes. Secure and drowsy Protestants think themselves blessed and say in their hearts as the angel of the, the church of Laodicea, quote, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Revelations 3.17, whereas indeed they are most miserable, wretched and poor, naked and blind. And the same fond opinion possesses the minds of our ignorant people who chant it in the very same tune, saying that God loves them and that they love God with all their hearts and their neighbors themselves, that they have perfect faith in Christ and ever had, not once so much as doubting of their salvation, that all is well with them and that they are past all danger whatsoever in the manner of salvation, of their salvation. Therefore, need not take so much care of it. Thus, you may see how men are commonly carried away with vain and fond conceits of their own excellency. And truly, so long as this overweening of our own righteousness reigns in our hearts, let preachers speak and say what they will. We can never become followers of Christ in practice of humility. Some will say, preadventure, that they never had any such opinion of their own righteousness. But I answer again that there was never yet any man descended of Adam save Christ, but he had this proud fantasy of ruling and reigning in him till such a time as God gave grace to change and alter his heart. In this inward pride, the less we discern it, the more it is. The more we discern it, the less it is. Therefore, though as yet you see it not in yourself, yet labor both to see and to feel it and to strive against it, casting down yourself for your own misery after Christ's own example, who being God abased himself to the condition of a miserable man. For you, will sh for you shall never be filled with the good things of God till you be emptied of self-love and self-liking. For this cause, let us purge and empty ourselves of all conceit of our own righteousness, that God may fill our hearts with his grace. Furthermore, the incarnation of Christ is the ground and foundation of all our comfort, as the names of Christ, serving to express the same to, to testify. Jacob in his last testament says that the scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh, that is Messiah, come. Now the name Shiloh signifies the tunic or skin that laps the infant in the mother's womb, called by the physicians the succadin, by a kind of figure it is put for the Son of God in the womb of the virgin made man. And Job, to comfort himself in his affliction, says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Job 19.25 Now the words which he uses to signify the Redeemer by is very emphatic, for it signifies a kinsman near uh, allied unto him of his own flesh that will restore him to life. And the Lord by the prophet Isaiah calls Christ Emmanuel. Isaiah 7.14, that is God with us. The name imports very much, namely that, that whereas by nature we have lost our fellowship with God because our sins are the wall of partition severing us from him yet nevertheless the same is restored to all that believe by the meter christ jesus because of his divine nature he is coupled in man's nature and so the word is made flesh and this straight conjunction of two natures into one person joins god to men and men to god yea by christ we are brought to god and save and have free access unto him and again in him we apprehend god and are made one with him. That's just a little taste of William Perkins on the incarnation and the practical applications of it. Just thought I'd read it to you this morning on the first day of February 2023. Yeah, I highly recommend William Perkins, the works. They're on sale right now, Reformation Heritage Books. Can't go wrong reading William Perkins. So I hope you're having a good week. This is Wednesday. Do pray that throughout the week that you're having a good reading week and that you're all doing well. Yeah, I uh, 
We'll just keep reading William Perkins up until noon and the day will go by. So until next time, bye.